How's it going folks? I hope you're all keeping well and you're very welcome to today's Leaving Cert History lesson, okay, on uh, the causes of the Irish Civil War. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Uh, so folks, the main cause of the Irish Civil War was the thing you see in the first line there, the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Okay, and this treaty divided both the Sinn Féin party and the IRA. And in particular, there are a number of things within the Anglo-Irish Treaty that really, really divided Ireland, okay, and divided Irish politicians, okay? So we're going to look at these now. The first controversial thing in the Anglo-Irish Treaty was the Oath of Allegiance. What was the Oath of Allegiance? Guys, the Oath of Allegiance was essentially... Uh, when Irish politicians, okay, in the Anglo-Irish Treaty, it stated that all Irish politicians had to swear an oath of allegiance to the British king every time they met up in Parliament, okay? Um, and you, naturally enough, you can see how that would cause a divide and cause a bit of, I suppose, unhappiness among politicians, okay? Like, for example, the pro-treaty politicians, so politicians who were in favour of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, they argued, oh, sure, look, it's, it's meaningless, the oath of allegiance. It doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just a, a pill we have to swallow. You know, get, get, on, get over with it, you know, basically. Like, get over it, like, you know. Um, meanwhile... Uh, Anti-treaty politicians, uh, for example, Carl Brugge, you know, they believe that it's an insult to the men of 1916 and an act of treason. They believe, why on earth would I swear an oath of allegiance to a British king that I have fought and put my life on the line for to break free from? Okay, so that was the anti-treaty view. Okay, that why would we swear an oath, an oath of allegiance to a king we're trying to break free from? Okay, um, so the oath of allegiance very, very controversial and very divisive. So it divided people in Ireland greatly. Okay, um, second part of the Anglo-Irish Treaty was that it gave Ireland dominion status. Okay, so. When the Irish negotiating team was going over to London to negotiate the Anglo-Irish Treaty, they were going with the goal of hopefully getting a 32-county republic, okay? I mean, but they did not achieve this, and the Anglo-Irish Treaty instead recognised Ireland as a dominion of the United Kingdom, okay? We were given dominion status, okay? Or same as uh, Canada and Australia at the time, had, they were dominions of the United Kingdom as well, okay? And modern politicians, so in particular the guys who actually negotiated this treaty, such as Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins, they accepted dominion status, okay? And while they said, all right, lads, look, it's not ideal, but it's a stepping stone towards getting proper independence and hopefully a republic, okay? Uh, meanwhile, that the kind of hardline Republicans, so again, guys, guys that had probably fought, you know, fought in the, the 1916 Rising, fought in the War of Independence, put their life on the line for Ireland, did not like the idea of Dominion status. They said, no way, we want a full Republic, we fought for a full Republic, okay? Um, you know, they couldn't see the fact that this was a stepping stone. They only wanted a full Republic and nothing else, okay? So very, very divisive terms within the Anglo-Irish Treaty there, guys, okay? Um... Another part of treaty that was very divisive and caused, you know, divide in Ireland was partition. Now, guys, remember, Ireland was partitioned before the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Ireland was actually partitioned in 1920 during the Government of Ireland Act, okay? But in 1921, when the Anglo-Irish Treaty was being negotiated, the Irish negotiating thing had hoped to get rid of partition, Okay, they'd hope to get rid of the border. So if we look at a map there to our right hand side to get rid of that border dividing the Irish Free State at the time with Northern Ireland. Okay, um, now they did not achieve this. Okay, but the Anglo-Irish negotiating team were told by Britain that look, we're gonna we'll, we'll redraw the border for Northern Ireland and we'll make Northern Ireland a really small area, a small and untenable area. Okay, and eventually, you know, it's going to become kind of useless and eventually it'll just slowly assimilate back into Ireland, okay? However, we know now today that this never happened, okay? This never happened and, uh, you know, Northern Ireland to this day still has the six counties which are under the, the flag of the United Kingdom, okay? Um, so that's, uh, you know, another very divisive treaty. Why is that divisive? Well, you know, there's plenty of nationalists in Northern Ireland, okay? And Republicans did not want to abandon those nationalists to a British government up north, okay? Um, so apart from the treaty, there were a number of other causes uh, of the Irish Civil War. And most of these causes um, are to do with how certain groups and how certain people reacted to the Anglo-Irish Treaty, okay? 
Uh, the first cause, guys, that's outside of the treaty uh, is the division of Sinn Féin. So, guys, long before the Anglo-Irish treaty was negotiated, Sinn Féin was quite a divided party. Okay, you had, if you look there to the bottom right of your slide, you had guys like Cahal Brugge, who was a hardline Republican, and you had more moderate guys like to the left of, of Brugge there, um, you have Arthur Griffith, who was a bit more moderate, not really in favour of violence, and was you know part of the negotiating team for the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Okay, and both of these guys were both before the treaty was negotiated. Both of these guys were very much focused on one thing, and that was defeating Britain and getting Britain out of Ireland. Okay, so that one common goal kind of brought the the two divisions within Sinn Fein together. However, after the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the divisions within Sinn Féin came to the forefront yet again. And these divisions became a source of tension within the party. Okay, and these, you know, these divisions that kind of always were there, but kind of, you know, were sort of in the background, finally came to the forefront and caused a division and, you know, led to the civil war. Okay, Ca led to your anti-treaty and your pro-treaty sides, which eventually led to the civil war. Okay, um, another factor of the Irish Civil War, the cause of the Irish Civil War, was the loose-knit structure of the IRA. Okay, so the IRA was an organisation that had a lot of kind of local commanders, and these commanders had great power in their area. There wasn't necessarily one kind of guy who was, you know, who, who had a say in every aspect and in every locality for the IRA. Okay, it very much had various commanders who had different ideas and opinions on certain things. Okay, so local IRA commanders such as Liam Lynch and Tom Barry in enjoyed freedom and power in their localities during the War of Independence. So the picture in the top right, guys, is Tom Barry, and you can see his IRA volunteers behind him, okay? And these guys were seen as, like, local legends, okay? So these Tom Barry, in particular, was a Munster IRA commander. And, uh, you know, in Munster, he was seen as a hero. He was seen as a, a true martyr for the Irish cause, and he got great respect, okay? So... He didn't feel that he had to really follow orders from anybody. He, he believed he was like the kind of, you know, the captain of his own ship, I suppose, you know. And, uh, you know, he was empowered by this power he had in Munster. And he didn't feel obliged to follow the orders from the government, particularly when it came to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. So when the Anglo-Irish Treaty was, uh, it was voted in, guys, by Dahl, by the Dahl Aaron. And guys like Tom Barry and Liam Lynch said, sure, I don't need to, I don't need to. Um, follow that. I don't agree with that. I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to fight against the treaty. Okay, so again, and that can be attributed to the loose knit structure of the IRA, where local commanders enjoyed a lot of empowerment and freedom um, within their local communities. I suppose. Um, another cause of the Irish Civil War was regional differences, guys, and and this these regional differences kind of go back to the similar to the point we were talking before about local commanders. Okay, so. Depending on where the IRA were and fought, okay, they had varying degrees of success, okay, so uh, the IRA, for example, achieved great success in Munster, so if we go back to this slide here, uh, the likes of Liam Lynch and Tom Barry, who were, cap who were commanders of the Munster Brigade of the IRA, these had successfully fought and kind of nearly defeated the British forces in Munster, okay, and these felt, oh sure, you know, we're after beating the British here. We're beating the British, so we should we should be negotiating the Anglo-Irish Treaty on our terms, and we should be, you know, getting what we want, a 32 county republic. Okay? And these guys who were victorious against the British didn't like the idea of a compromise. Like, why would we compromise with a crowd that we're after beating? Okay? Meanwhile, while in Munster it was all great for the IRA, they were beating the British, in Leinster and Connacht it wasn't as good. Okay? So, the IRA in Leinster and Connacht achieved uh, they were less successful against the British they were kind of struggling to fight the British okay because in you know think about Leinster the the, the, the British kind of uh, whole of administration was Dublin Castle so you know there are a lot of British forces around there okay so it was difficult to fight the British in places like Leinster so as a result IRA IRA in Leinster were happier to accept the compromise because they they hadn't really defeated the British in Leinster. Okay, yeah, they'd fought a war with them. You know, uh, nothing had really happened. It was kind of like a, it kind of reached a stalemate. Both sides were kind of you know it was kind of like blow for blow kind of tactics. Both sides had never hadn't really made any inroads into each other, and uh, as a result, the IRA in Leinster and Connacht said, right, fair enough. Look, at, we'll, we'll have a we'll have a chance. We'll have a compromise, and we'll see where that takes us. Okay, now. Uh, again, another big cause of the Civil War 
Who was it? The British government. Okay, of course, the British government couldn't help but dip their nose in Irish affairs. Okay, so the Anglo-Irish Treaty has just been voted in in Dáil Éireann. Okay, now it wasn't voted in by a landslide. It just barely got in by a few votes. Okay, um, what happened then? Well, we know that Eamon de Valera was staunchly anti-Treaty. He got up and he walked out of the Dáil. What did he do? He um, Well, he, did, he, did, he didn't have anything to do with this, but a group of anti-Treaty IRA members called the Irregulars, within a few days of the Dahl Bill being passed, occupied the four courts. Okay? And uh, this annoyed the British government. The British government said, oh, don't tell me there's more violence happening in Ireland. Okay? So the British government put considerable pressure on Collins to take action against the Irregulars. So the Irregulars, they're anti treaty IRA men who occupied the four courts. Okay? And Collins was in control of the pro treaty side, who are now called the Irish Free State Army, okay? And the British put considerable pressure on Collins to use the Irish Free State Army to attack the guys in the four courts, okay? Uh, and the British basically said to Collins, Collins, if, unless you attack those guys in the four courts, uh, you know, we're going to put British soldiers in Ireland again and the war against Ireland, between Ireland and Britain will resume. Okay, here we have a picture here, guys. So the guys uh, in the bottom of the picture are Irish Free State soldiers and they're attacking the anti-treaty uh, irregulars that are, you know, um, in the four courts. Okay, um, and this is quite a tragic event, guys, because the men, so the men you see in front of you there firing at the four courts would have been comrades of the guys, the irregulars who were in the four courts. You know, at one stage, both of those sides are fighting together against Brit British occupation, whereas now they're fighting against each other. And again, a lot, you know, th a lot. This this particular battle is due to the pressure put on Co Michael Collins by the British government. Okay, Michael, unless you get rid of those guys out of the four courts, we're going to reoccupy Ireland. Okay, so a very very tragic event that one in particular. Um. Eamon de Valera's role was highly controversial when it came to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Okay, um, so first of all, he didn't even attend to treaty negotiations, okay? And many argue that by not attending negotiations in London, he lessened the chance of getting unified support for the treaty. And this was definitely true, okay? So, you know, it was kind of funny that, like, why would the leader of, of our government on our country in Ireland, why would he not go to negotiate uh, this treaty, okay? Like, he sent kind of Michael Collins, who was, you know, more of a, a soldier, really, you know, Arthur Griffith, these kind of fellas who weren't as experienced in negotiating as Collins was, or sorry, as Eamon de Valera was, okay? Also, if Eamon de Valera had went to London... OK, see there, he, by not going, he lessened the chance of getting a unified support for the treaty. If Eamon de Valera had went to London, OK, when he came back, you know, Eamon de Valera, guys, was like a, you know, a poster boy. People in Ireland loved him. And if, if people saw in Ireland, oh, Eamon's involved in negotiating that treaty, oh, sure, it must be a good thing then. And, uh, you know, I, I think, yeah, fair enough, I'll be in favour of that treaty. OK, so, like, people kind of, you know, they worshipped the every, you know, the shadow Eamon de, Eamon de Valera walked on. OK, so... If Eamon de Valera was seen to have taken part in negotiating the treaty, more and more people would have been in favour of because they would have thought, oh, our great, you know, our great man here, de Valera, negotiated this. So it must be a good thing. Okay. Um, as you've already said, guys, the second point in the slide here, and a very significant point, is Eamon de Valera did not accept the democratic decision of the Dáil in favour of the treaty. Okay. So when the, when the Dáil voted in favour of, of the treaty, okay, just vote fairly democratically, Eamon de Valera was so against the treaty, he got up and walked out of the Dáil. Okay, and this made conflict more likely. Why? Because as we know, de Valera was like a, a god in Ireland at the time. People loved him. And all Eamon de Valera's followers would think, sure, he doesn't he, he, he doesn't like the treaty. But if he doesn't like it, I don't like it. And that, would, that was going to make conflict far more likely. Okay, um, bottom uh, line there, guys. It's, it's claimed many anti-treaty Republicans would have supported the treaty if Eamon de Valera had done so. So again, guys, the idea that a lot of you know, Republicans who really like Eamon de Valera, who are proper, you know, Eamon de Valera fanboys, they would have done anything Eamon de Valera did. They would have did anything Eamon de Valera told them to do. Okay? So the fact that de Valera was not in favour of the treaty, he was walking out of the doll, they thought, oh, well, sure, it must be a bad thing then. I'm not going to support that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the anti-treaty IRA and fight against it. Okay? Folks, thanks very much for watching. Keep an eye on the page for more posts.